Okay, welcome back to part two of your exam review. Um, we're going to continue on with a bit of thermodynamics and we're going to move on to some kinetics or rate law um, in just a few minutes. So let's, uh, let's just jump right back into it. We're on example five now. Uh, there's one correct answer for number five. So for which of these do you expect delta H, the change in entropy, to be negative? So think about this. If the change in entropy is negative, that means it's becoming less that's what the negative tells you, disordered. Now that's a strange way of saying more ordered. So if delta S is negative, it's less disordered or more ordered. So let's take a look at our choices here. On letter A, we start with two solids and a gas, and we turn it into two gases. Here, delta S would be positive because we end up with two gases from one. Let's take a look at letter B. Here we have a solid, and it's solid bromine, turned into liquid bromine. Well, we learned earlier that liquids are more disordered than solids, so delta S for that reaction would be positive as well. And then letter C, this is the one I get the most question on, talks about uh, the fact that we have water as a liquid at 25 Celsius, and we're turning it into water as a liquid at 50 Celsius. Now think the temperature is increasing, which increases the kinetic energy of those particles. They're moving faster, and as a result, disorder at a higher temperature increases. So that leaves us with, leaves us with letter D. Obviously that has to be our answer, but let's just check to make sure. Don't we start with a total of three gases, Cl2 gas and two Hi gases? So we start with three gases we end up with a solid and only two gases. So here, entropy change is negative. It's less disordered. It means it's becoming more ordered. Now just a heads up, number six will be a bit more difficult than what I would give you on the test. I thought I would throw it in here though just for fun. Um, it is a multiple choice question, so don't let that fool you too much as if it's going to be too easy. Um, this is using the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the value of delta G at two temperatures. Well, actually, one at one temperature it's given to us. At 298, it's positive 91.2. And we want to know what that would be at 1,000 Kelvin. So what we first need to do is solve for the entropy change of this reaction. Uh, the entropy change of a reaction... Um, is pretty much temperature independent. That's not true as we've learned earlier for delta G. Delta G we know is temperature dependent. In fact, in this case we have two positives. Delta H and delta G are both positive. If I flash back to an earlier problem when delta A, oh sorry, my mistake. Oh, we don't know delta S, but let's take a look and see. Delta S is a solid, or excuse me, the reaction starts as a solid and becomes two gases. So we know that delta S is going to have a positive number. Um, so now I can say it. Delta H and delta S are both positive. Now we'll flash back to an earlier page. When delta H and delta S were both positive, the reaction, positive and positive, the reaction could become spontaneous if the temperature is high enough. So in our problem, we're starting it out at 298 Kelvin, which is 25 Celsius, and we are raising the temperature, so potentially we could have um, a negative delta G, and the reaction could be spontaneous. So let's figure it out here. Uh, we know that at 298, the delta G is positive 91.2 kilojoules. The delta H is positive 176 kilojoules. My temperature is 298 Kelvin, and my change in entropy, well, we're going to have to solve for that. So how are we going to solve for change in entropy? Well, let's do it one step at a time. Uh, delta G minus delta H would be equal to a negative T delta S. And if I wanted to solve for delta S, don't you agree that would be delta G minus delta H still on this side? sorry for the little mistake there, all over the negative of the temperature. So let's find out 
what the change in entropy is. So delta G is positive 91.2, delta H positive 176, my temperature 298, and we're going to take the negative of this. So let's see what that turns out to be. Let's clear everything out here. We have 91.2 minus 176, then we'll divide that by 298, and the negative of that would be 0.285, and that would be in the unit kilojoules. So we know my delta S for the reaction is 0.285, and the change in entropy is temperature independent, and so is the delta H. So we're going to find a new delta G here. So we're going to work that over here, our new delta G, this will be at the high temperature, will be delta H, which is still 176 kilojoules, minus my new temperature, so I want to find the value at 1000 Kelvin, times my delta S, which I just solved for, which is 0.285 kilojoules. So let's plug and chug and see what we get. 176 minus, we'll use my parentheses key here, 1000 times 0.285, close off the parentheses, equals a negative 109. So my delta G, sure enough, it does become negative at a higher temperature. So my answer is letter A. Now on the exam, once again, I probably won't have you do one this difficult. I'll probably just have you solve for delta G and determine whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. But this was a good review problem. Made it a bit more difficult. If you can do this one, you'll be able, you should be able to do any that I put on the test. Okay, let's start reviewing rate law a little bit. This is uh, example seven on the worksheet. And to determine rate law, we need to have experimental data. So I have this butyl bromide, here's the formula for it, and it's reacting with water vapor, and the reaction is represented below. And I have some data for that reaction. And so what I want to do is I want to find the orders of these reactants. Now remember, the way you find the order of a reactant, kiddos, is you have to have experimental data. Um, we did say um, that you can find the order if it's a single step reaction, but, but that information is not given to you. So the only way we can find the order is if we have experimental data. So let's first find the order for the butyl bromide, this, this compound here. And so I want to find it where this is changing, but the other reactant staying constant. So let's take a look. In experiments two and three, do you see how the water vapor is staying constant here? Yet, the butyl bromide, this stuff right here, is going from 5 times 10 to the negative second to 1 times 10 to the negative first. It's doubling. So what's the result of doubling the concentration of this reactant? Well, the rate goes from 2 times 10 to the negative 6 to 4 times 10 to the negative 6. The rate doubles also. So doubling this reactant while keeping this one constant causes the rate to double. That means this reactant is first order. So in my answer sheet, I'm just going to put first order for that reactant. How about the order with respect to water vapor? Well, now we want the water vapor to change while the other reactant stays constant. So in experiments one and two, you can see the butyl, butyl bromide stays constant this time, but the water vapor doubles two times 10 to the negative second to four times 10 to the negative second. And the rate doesn't change at all. So, even though water vapor is doubled, it has no effect on the rate. Remember, we call those zero order reactants. So I'm going to put zero on my answer sheet. Now the overall order is the sum of the individual orders. So one plus zero is first. So the overall order is first order. Now we can write the rate equation, or rate law. Remember, they all begin with R equals K. And then we have our reactant, CH3, and there are three of those bonded to a carbon and a bromine. And that's to the first power. And then the other reactant, H2O, 
is to the zero power. Now, if you ever have a rate law and one of the reactants is to the zero power, remember, that's just like multiplying by one. So if you wanted to leave that off, I would be very happy with that. Okay, either version's okay. Now, I'm expecting you to be able to calculate the rate constant. So this is um, some pretty basic math here. Using this equation here, K would be equal to R over the concentration of CH3, 3, CBR to the first power and water vapor to the zero power, so I'm going to leave it off. Now to calculate this, I need to have a rate and the concentration of this reactant. So I'm going to use the first experiment, where the rate is 2 times 10 to the negative sixth molarity units per minute. So 2.0 times 10 to the negative sixth molarity units of that reactant, or excuse me, um, of that product being created per minute, and we're going to divide that by the butyl bromide concentration during that experiment, which is 5 times 10 to the negative second. I'm going to write it as 0 0.050, if that's okay with you, and that's molarity units to the first power. So those molarity units would divide out. My unit would be 1 over minutes, or some people like to call that minutes to the negative first. So let's see what the rate constant is. We have 2 second EE to the negative sixth divided by 0 0.050, zero, enter. We're allowed two significant figures, so my rate constant is 4.0 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay? You should be able to handle that for the exam. Now, once you know the rate constant, you can find the rate of the reaction by using your rate law at any concentration of your reactants. Okay, um, I would, if I were you, I would do the two or three examples we did in our notes before the test to make sure you're ready. Now let's do example eight, and then we'll wrap up part two, and we'll save the last couple of examples for part three. Now, example eight deals with an energy curve. Now, just as a quick review, uh, on an energy curve, these are your reactants and these are your products. This is the potential energy of the reactants. This is the potential energy of the products. The difference between reactants and products is the delta H of the reaction. A couple other things. The energy to get to the top of the hill is called the activation energy. And that's the activation energy for the forward reaction. And we could also have an activation energy for the backwards reaction. And we call that E sub A prime, if you remember. So let's take a look. Which energy curve represents a highly exothermic reaction? Now exothermic means delta H is negative. That has a tiny activation energy. Okay, so let's think about that. Um, exothermic means delta H is negative. Well, let's see. On this first graph, my reactants are here and my products gain energy. So delta H is positive there. This is an endothermic reaction. Let's take a look at letter B. Here are my reactants, here are my products. Once again, I gain energy here, so delta H is positive. That's another endothermic reaction. So A and B are not exothermic. Let's take a look at C and D. It looks like my reactants are here, my products are here. Looks like I lose a little bit of energy. So delta H is negative. C is exothermic. But the activation energy of the forward reaction is pretty big. Let's take a look at letter D. Letter D, my reactants to my products, I give off a bunch of energy. So I'm losing energy, delta H is negative, and the activation energy for the forward reaction is tiny. That's my answer. The reaction's exothermic, and the activation energy for the forward reaction is small. Okay? So keep this example in mind. Of course, there's no math involved, but it's, it covers a pretty important concept. Okay, that wraps up part two. We'll conclude our review by doing some equilibrium with part three next. Thanks.